Uh, this panel is devoted to a topic uh, that was raised repeatedly during the first panel, which is the idea of increasing the extent to which the taxation of income generated by corporations is done at the shareholder level rather than at the corporate level. And we'll have a variety of perspectives uh, and issues raised as to the advantages and disadvantages of that approach. Let me say that this topic is not only so important that we devote this uh, session to it, but that uh, AEI, in conjunction with the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, will hold yet another conference on this very topic of shareholder taxation. Uh, this will be on Friday, June 17th, uh, here uh, in this room. And the uh, purpose of that conference will be for me and Eric Toder of the Urban Institute to present our most recent plan for shifting taxation towards the shareholder level, a plan that may be mentioned briefly uh, during the discussion of this panel. And uh, we're going to be privileged to have Dan Shaviro of NYU Law School and Joanne Weiner of uh, George Washington University Economics Department to discuss our uh, uh, plan along with, of course, the opportunity for audience participation. So if you're interested in shareholder taxation, I think you'll be interested in this uh, session that we're about to start, and I hope you'll also be interested to come back here on the 17th uh, for that conference. But to turn to matters at hand, we have another distinguished uh, panel here. Uh, the, we will first be hearing from Harry Grubert of the Treasury Department, He'll be speaking on behalf of himself and Roseanne Altshuler of Rutgers University. Then we'll hear from Dan Halperin of Harvard Law School, and then from David Chizer, whom we've already um, um, has been introduced to you uh, from Columbia Law School. And so without uh, further ado, let me turn it over to you, Harry. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. Um, uh, let me first say that uh, the, the usual disclaimer that's up there, that nothing, this, uh, nothing I say should be in any way construed to be reflecting the views or policy of the U.S. Treasury Department. They're, as I've said before, they're really not my views, they're Roseanne's. She just, <laughs> let, she just lets me present them. Uh, and so she'll, she can correct me if I make any mistakes. Okay, as Alan said, this is sort of, uh, was mentioned in the previous uh, uh, in the, in the previous uh, uh, sessions, particularly by Glenn Hubbard, who thought that uh, what, uh, uh, one possible tax reform was to, in the shifting of uh, the corp uh, taxation of corporate income from the corporate level to the personal level. So uh, the idea is that you lower the corporate tax rate substantially. We lower it to 15%. But at the same time, you tax uh, interest, you, uh, you tax dividends and capital gains at ordinary rates, 39.6, so what a pl what plus the investment income tax. Uh, but, th but if you just did that, there would be very substantial uh, behavioral changes. People wouldn't, uh, there'd be a, a substantial decline in the realizations of capital gains. There, people would, re because d dividends are being taxed at a much higher rate, there'd be fewer dividend distributions. And also there'd be very, uh, there'd be other uh, distributional uh, changes. But let me, uh, let, uh, let me go through the, f I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, the, we agree, I think, every, especially with David, that the high, the high, the 35 percent rate or anything like that is unsustainable. Income shifting and inversions keep growing in importance. New round, there's a new round of ta tax competition. For example, the United Kingdom is going down to 17 percent, not far from our 15 percent proposal. And there's a, one form in which t uh, tax competition is taking is in the introduction of patent boxes. Virtually every country except the United States is introduced at Ten, uh, has a, a patent box in which you can shift a lot of intangible income into the um, into this particular kind of favored income. The, the United Kingdom has a 10% patent box. The, the Netherlands has a 5% patent box, for example. For example, and um, so it's as David is has emphasized it's important to lower the corporate rate just uh, just because what is happening because of income shifting and all that but base broadening doesn't get you very far it doesn't get you to 25 percent maybe gets you to 28 percent so you need you need much more substantial reduction of corporate income in the corporate income tax rate to enter into this game and to to discourage income shifting and so on and as we, as I said, which I jumped ahead inadvertently, is that we lower the corporate tax rate to 15 percent. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
and, and uh, you capital that gains. For me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's thanks. Capital gains and dividends are taxed as ordinary income, but an important, as I said, that would re that would result it would, by itself. It would result in a great deal, of, a, a very large behavioral changes. There'd be a great, uh, there'd be a very large decline in capital gains realizations. There'd be fewer dividend distribution just because they're taxed at a much higher rate, and there'd be other changes like that. There, there'd be a. Company, if you're taxed at a very high rate on the personal level, and the corporate rate is only 15 percent, you try to hide passive. In you try to accumulate passive income in a corporation that have to accumulate only at 15 percent, and also there'd be a strong tendency to recharacterize labor income into corporate income. So the as the 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 important aspect of our proposal is that in order to counter to counteract these potential of large behavioral changes is we impose an interest charge when as the, when a stock is sold so if you sold if you sell after 10 years for example for example you have to impute the gain to each you spread the gain over each of the 10 years and for each year you impose the appropriate interest rate and the objective is to get to offset any of these potential behavioral changes and get get you back to basically the behavior, the liquidation behavior, the dividend behavior under that we have under current law. So let's go into a little more detail uh, on the proposal. The gain is spread over a holding period. There is a, a design question which we'll get to. Do you assume an even linear gain over the holding period, or do you assume an equal rate of return? As we'll see, uh, we pr we prefer the equal rate of return over that holding period because it's fair to the um, to the taxpayer, and also because of the interest charge and the high taxation of capital gains and dividends. There are two uh, backstop rules that are necessary. One is you uh, a deemed realization of death including the interest charges. That's, in fact, the president's budget in the last two years has had a, a similar proposal without the interest charge aspect. And also there should be an annual, there has to be an annual limit on, on dividend distributions that they can't be much larger than current earnings because there's a distinction, the capital gains bear the interest charge over time and dividends do not. So you wouldn't want to have, just before, um, uh, Say an owner of a company sells the company. He wouldn't want you wouldn't want to have the, given the opportunity to immediately before to declare a large dividend, which doesn't bear the interest charge. And in fact, in many aspects, there's already a, there's already a, it's not as if this is a terrible a great even in the tax code. This uh, already precedent for this in the passive foreign investment company rules that if you buy. Um, an a foreign investment fund that you may be subject to these rules and in fact it's a very punitive system so ours is much more simplified but it also it, it, you ha under the PFIC rules you have to impute um, the uh, return over the holding period and you impose this penalty interest charge and we uh, we agree uh, this the imposition of the interest charge goes back a long way. It goes back to Vickery's Journal of Political Economy paper in 1939. It's sometimes called retrospective taxation. And, um, and we concede we're not um, optimal in the sense of the Auerbach Vickery uh, sense. And this, uh, their purpose was to uh, create neutrality between holding an asset and reinvest, uh, holding an asset and reinvesting and, and selling it and, and then reinvesting in some other asset. We're not, uh, we're not, we're not trying to be that idealistic or, 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 um, um, or we don't have those big ambitions. All we want to do is set the interest rate that gets you back to current, basically the behavior under current law. And one um, aspect, an important aspect of this regime no, I can do it actually. <laughs> no, it's all, it's all, is that it applies to all capital gains, including carried interest, not just public and not just publicly traded financial assets. So it, it doesn't have some of the disadvantages of a mark-to-market system for publicly traded goods. And um, and as under current law, gains for a pass-through get basis adjustment for previously taxed income of the business. 
and, we, and we've done some simulations, some simulations, and it does suggest that if we're, we're, for relatively low interest rates, you can sort of basically restore behavior under, uh, 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 in terms of dividend payout beha behavior and also realization behavior under, um, that you have under current law. And as has been suggested, the 50% rate is a, very, is a very large reduction. And as you, we would expect, of, uh, it really reduces the benefit of income shifting and also inversion, inversion gains, for example, interest stripping and getting up from the US tax net, not, net is much reduced. And also we've looked, we've, uh, we're, we haven't made official treasury revenue estimates, but we've looked, we have sort of in the ballpark or suggestive uh, references to revenue, and it, the proposal appears to be feasible in terms of revenue neutrality with only modest base broadening. I, we assumed, I think, a 10% increase in the corporate tax base, which is relatively modest. And the sources of the increased revenue to offset the large reduction in the corporate tax are the uh, revenue from capital, uh, the increased revenue from capital gains, where you're, you're taxing at a very high, much higher rate, dividends, and realization of death, including the interest charges. And we also assume some modest reduction in uh, income shifting, just because of a much lower uh, corporate shift of the reduction of the corporate rate from 35 to 15 percent. And further, we've, we've also looked at the uh, distribution considerations and the proposal is progressive. So in fact, the higher income people will be taxed more under this proposal. One reason is the less the tax on corporate income is borne by labor. Because what, as Alan was describing, the incidence of the corporate tax and because of capital, uh, international capital mobility, once, if, if a high corporate tax can laws cause a capital outflow, and that's borne by labor because they have less capital to work with, and under this much higher rate on um, capital gains and dividends, that applies both to foreign holdings of, holdings of foreign shares and domestic shares. So in a way, uh, the cap, uh, uh, to some extent, the capital can't escape because of this shift in, from uh, of taxation of corporate income to the personal level. And also, you're replacing a un the uniform corporate tax, which applies to all, uh, all corporate income. Which, and no, no matter who owns it, it could be, it could, they could be owned by relative, some of the stock could be owned by relatively um, not, uh, low income people. But you're replacing this with the progressive income tax schedule at the personal level, because that's where the, the corporate income is being taxed. And we'd expect that there would be great, greater investment in the U.S. corporate sector by both foreign and domestic investors. So that's another reason why domestic labor would, would be better off than under the current system. And then we just have this simple example that was devised by Roseanne of, uh, of uh, how the interest charge would, would uh, work. For example, we assume a gain of 1,000 over a 10-year period. So under the simplest version, you just spread it evenly over the 10 years. So you impute $100 of, each of gain in each of the 10 years. And then in the, in, the sec in the third column, you can see you apply this 3% interest rate to each of the years. And of course, the first year gets, a much, gets the, the largest imputation of interest. And, um, and so finally, instead of the, uh, when you sell the stock, instead of your taxable income increasing by 1,000, it, it increases at this 3% rate uh, to $1,146, approximately 15%. And we recognize there are some design issues. For example, what tax rate for yearly gain, what tax rate you impose for the yearly gains uh, over the holding period. And they're PFIC. You have to go back and it's a top marginal rate in each of the years of the holding period. We, we are just using a much simpler system where you, uh, you just, uh, you calculate the, inter the imputed interest when you sell this, when you sell this, the security, and you just add that to taxable income, so you're just, it, it just the tax rate is just the one that's relevant for that year. And then, as I said, one of the design issues are if you assume an even, even our constant annual gain over the holding period or an equal rate of return. We prefer the equal rate of return because it's more favorable to the taxpayer. If you use an even rate of return, you backload or the, the uh, gain into the early years of the holding period, which will bear the highest interest rate. And um, 
The question is, uh, how do you calculate, what interest rate do we suggest? As again, it's determined empirically, it's just the one that will get you back to the current behavior. We're not trying to have the, hour, the, the, the ideal Vickery Auerbach um, um, Choice, uh, neutral choice between holding an asset uh, and selling it and reinvesting the proceeds. And then there's a question whether we should uh, have a mark-to-market op um, option for publicly traded assets. We, we uh, suggest that we should have a mark-to-market option. It's, it makes like, it, to the extent you could have that for traded securities, it, it was, it, I think it would be greatly simplifying. You wouldn't have to have the interest charge for that, for that category, category of asset. And in fact, that there was that option in PFIC. And um, unlike PFIC, we think the treat we, we uh, think there should be a symmetric treatment of losses. So if you have if you sell an asset at a loss, uh, you uh, the also you impute the loss over the holding period, and and the losses will bear an interest rate. Uh, of course, the, uh, you, so you can certainly offset those against gains. And as under current law, presumably there'd be some limit on the extent to which you can take losses in any particular year. And then. Um, under a transition rule, the question arises, how do you treat holding periods that extend before the effective date? So we would, assume, uh, we would uh, take the easiest uh, method that you impute a gain to each of the years of the holding period as you do as you as you would even beyond the holding period beyond the effective date, but you would only impose the higher tax rate and the uh, interest charge after the holding period. And then, uh, since we've tried to simplify this system, it's much simpler than the, the PFIC rules. We think that the, the although it may sound complicated, we think uh, that the IRS could just publish a table every year, a table based on one dimension would be the percentage gain, and the other dimension would would be the the years in the holding period, and that would give you how much you have to add to taxable income in addition to the in, to this, in, in addition to the normal capital gain. Oh, 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 thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I have to thank my co-author here. Uh, I think there was some discussion of how foreign income is is uh, treated, and um, we think there should be some uh, t uh, should be on a territorial basis. Uh, but uh, but uh, and uh, there's a pr pr uh, there's the choice, uh, but subject to a minimum tax. And the big design question there is whether you have an overall minimum tax, that is, you combine all country, or you have a per country minimum tax. As we've previously be proposed in a paper in the National Tax Journal three years ago, and um, was also part of the uh, president's proposals. Um, in the, in the budget of the last two years uh, at 19 percent, 19 percent plus. We, in our paper, we recommend a 50 percent, but we'll get to that. And um, it, it, so it, it would be some sort of minimum tax. The overall minimum tax is much simpler, so we would probably uh, prefer that. And then, um, um, and, uh, but we have to make clear that it's not like a worldwide system. The, the royalties, unlike the, uh, the current system, where royalties can be absorb excess credits from other, from other, from high tax dividends, royalties would be separately taxed at 15 percent. And as I just mentioned, the minimum tax, um, and the, uh, we sort of like that. We proposed this uh, three years ago. We proposed this uh, this per country minimum tax at 15 percent with expensing. In each of the each country, so you're only taxing the excess return. There's been a lot of discussion of excess returns and the, and the return to intangibles. So presumably, it would be you you could U, U.S. companies could still be competitive because they could always finance their their investment, assuming you earn the normal return that they could just they could just issue bonds or or stocks in the, in the market. Uh, and but you so it wouldn't affect their investment behavior internationally, but they'd be taxed on their excess return. And the question, uh, uh, um, we still like that proposal. If that passed the Congress, we'd be fairly happy. Uh, but um, um, the, but there are some advantages of the current shifting proposal. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to doing that. <laughs> because. Um, First of all, there would be a, a change in the uh, shifting incentive. Under the minimum tax, you raise the, basically you raise the tax rate, the effective tax rate, the tax rate in all low tax countries like Ireland and Bermuda and so on. So you would reduce shifting um, at, to those locations. 
but, but you don't reduce the German or the UK 17% tax and, and so on. So there could be some still continuous shifting to, uh, from Ireland to the, the, at 12.5% to the UK at 17%, which is still much higher than our, which is, would be still higher than our um, normal corporate rate. Uh, but under this, uh, uh, our 15% proposal, the US tax rate would be re reduced compared to all other foreign countries. So there'd be a, a uniform reduction in income shifting. But probably more important is the, imp the differing impact on inversions that uh, under the minimum tax, there's an increase of corporate tax at the, uh, at the corporate level tax, which is substantial according to the Treasury revenue estimates, at least for the 19% proposal. And, but, but here there's, um, in this proposal, there's a reduction of the corporate level, a very substantial reduction of the corporate level tax. So there'd be less of incentive, to, compared to current law, there'd be a much less smaller incentive to, to um, invert compared to uh, cur current law and also compared to the minimum tax. And then um, I can skip by, by this because I just wanted the 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 who owns the corporate tax base um, is just really a preliminary uh, to, to discuss integration. So before I come to the conclusion, I want to discuss some of these other proposals, particularly the ones that related to um, the Chris Hanna's um, um, description of integration and interest withholding. First. First, first of all, as Steve Rosenthal um, uh, has, uh, uh, has recently written a paper that only 25% of, uh, of U.S. corporate stock is held by taxable individual shareholders. So there's not really not much of a minimum tax. The old, incentive, the old um, reason to have corporate tax integration to reduce the minimum tax now has a much smaller role. But integration seems to have now been resurrected to do something else, that is to... Uh, to reduce the benefits of income shifting and inversion. Um, but first of, all, first of all, we looked at the data, and even if you had these restrictions, that is, either uh, under any of these, the, the, the two basic, basic um, integration schemes, it's the, the frank dividend, like the Australian scheme, where the shareholder gets a, a, a dividend that's exempt or that, that carries a credit, but only to the extent that the corporation has paid Australian tax, in this case, U.S. tax. Then there's the dividend withhold, there's the, the dividend deduction scheme that Chris Hanna mentioned. All of them are sort of, uh, you only get the benefit if, in fact, there's been a corporate level tax paid. But in fact, uh, we looked at the data, and half of U.S. multinational corporations now pay enough U.S. corporate tax to finance the dividend, to give full credits to the dividends they now pay off. So at least half of them, and so that, that half could, could continue shifting. But the most important part, the most important um, um, point is that, uh, and I don't think Chris had to address this issue, and that is that there's a big hole of capital gains, both the tax exempts the pension funds, foreigners, are not taxed on capital gains. And you get the whole benefit of shifting by, by, selling, by holding a stock and the company decide not to pay dividends and everyone who realizes the benefit of income shifting and aversion just through capital gains. Um, and and, and, and for, the, all, for most of the holders, that would, that would be a tax of zero. The, the point about capital gains is it doesn't use up this taxes paid, that this is ta the taxes paid account or it doesn't use up, it does, or it does, under the Australian type system, it doesn't use up the franking account. So I think, um, so that's why, as Chris Hanna mentioned, the uh, ALI report, the American Law Institute report, uh, written by Al Warren in 1993, and that's why he recognized that he made it very clear about the importance of filling the capital gains uh, hole, and he's, he suggested that all, uh, all holders, foreigners, tax exempts, pension funds, and, dom and domestic individuals pay capital gains tax at the top marginal, top personal marginal rate. Now, I don't know, I, we haven't had the details of the Senate finance proposal, but I'd be, I wonder if they're going to be taxing capital gains at 39.6. <coughs> so um, um, I think several, I think Ed Kleinbard and I, and, I, and we and us um, agree that, sort of integra that integration is really weak um, vehicle for trying to control inversions and income shifting because uh, dividends are something that, that the company and shareholders can decide to reduce or increase. So it's a very elastic um, um, kind of um, policy vehicle, policy instrument. 
And then, of course, and the corporate rate still has, it would still remain 35% for retained income. So there'd be still an incentive to the extent the company shifts income, it retains income, it would still have an incentive to eliminate that 35% tax. And then another, that was also part of, it appears to be something else we'd like to discuss because it's sort of, it's part of the current environment, and that is withholding tax on interest, which seems to be part of the, uh, um, uh, the Senate finance proposal, and that is, uh, the, the, but the problem with uh, withholding tax on interest is that there's a large number of domestic and foreign issuers of highly substitutable debt. It's a very integrated market. Withholding on one in, uh, segment will lead to large portfolio shifts with little effect on net interest received by investors. Presumably, uh, the Senate finance proposals uh, will just be withholding an interest at the corporate level, but there are all sorts of other debt. There's foreign issued, uh, there's debt issued by, in dollars by foreign corporations, there's mortgage debt, there's non-corporate non debt. So presumably there'll be a shift. So basically it'll just mean that the, the gross interest rate that, that, uh, that, has to, uh, that will be paid by domestic corporate, by the, the corporate sector will be much higher than it was before. <laughs> Similarly, uh, I shouldn't take their name in vain, but, but Alan Viard and, um, and Eric Toder in their most recent revision of their mark-to-market -market system, um, after revision, they, they also have interest of holding to payments to tax exempts and pension funds. But that just means pension funds and tax exempts will buy foreign debt or some, or some like, or, or mortgage debt or, or non-corporate debt. And they'll end up being, ending, getting virtually the same interest rates uh, that they're receiving, the net interest rates that they're receiving now. So I think this, uh, um, again, it's not, um, I think it has to be considered more, more thoroughly. With the, uh, and, um, and I think Alan Arbach alluded to that, that under these in an interest withholding system, there's always the problem of financial institutions. What do you do with, with them? Because the, the, the intermediation spread will be much larger than the, will be much smaller than the gross withholding tax. Now, uh, Alan Auerbach has a solution, so we'd be, we'd be interested in that. Uh, but it, it's another complication, and especially, and, I, and, and particularly um, if there are transactions other than business, business U.S. business to U.S. business, pay, pay, transactions with foreigners and so on. At one time, we had withholding on interest payments to foreigners, but banks were always out of the system, so uh, so m the money all flo always flowed through banks. <coughs> and. Um, even if, um, no, if, if, if by some happenstance you manage to make this interest withholding system work, um, you may have a, it may not be a great thing. In fact, uh, many years ago, 1994, Jack Moody and I had a paper in the National Tax Journal on, on the, the CBIT, Comprehensive Business Income Tax, where interest was, was non-deductible, just like equity, just, just like uh, equity, and we found just because the, uh, that is a very um, highly substitutable, very mobile kind of asset, we found there would be a substantial reduction of the U.S. capital stock. So even if you can make interest rate with interest withholding work, it's not clear it would be a great thing for the U.S. And uh, I, I, unfortunately, I've, I've run out of time. Uh, and, uh, but we conclude that the 50 percent corporate rate and capital gains and dividends at an interest, uh, with an interest charge at ordinary rates is feasible in terms of revenue and more effective than integration and discouraged income shifting, and there's no tax cliff between traded and non-traded securities. And um, we think that interest charges and deferred tax appears the only feasible way to tax capital gains and, and, and dividends at ordinary rates. So President Saunders will probably be very happy with that aspect of the proposal. And we, we, all, and we also think that uh, withholding taxes uh, and integration schemes are probably something that should be, uh, uh, are probably not the greatest uh, contribution to policy making. Thanks. Should I get this? Uh, what happened? Go back one. Go back one? Yeah, I think I will. Is that okay. One? Yeah, that's what I wanted to be. Okay. Yeah. Long <laughs> okay. Uh, presumably, uh, they invited me to participate in this because of the paper I wrote uh, 
six years ago at, when I was spending a semester at the Tax Policy Center, uh, which up, up, you can see it up on the top of that slide, which is called Mitigating the Potential Inequities of, of Reducing Corporate Rates, where I tried to focus on what you'd have to do, all of it pretty complicated, if you wanted to limit the benefits of lower corporate rates to presumably the, the intended uh, target. Uh, and view of, in view of the uh, discussion this morning, particularly Chris focusing on integration, I think I'm going to try to depart from my notes and, and focus a little bit on integration. One of the things that uh, I discussed in that paper was the distinction between integration. Why was integration unpopular and not getting adopted while the idea of a lower corporate rate uh, seemed to be something that everybody was talking about doing at least six years ago? Of course, it's seven years ago. still hasn't happened. Um, and it seemed to me that there, there basically were two differences. Uh, and uh, the question is, is whether those differences are, are essential. And, and the first difference is that the, even a system like the one that is, this, this table comes from the earlier paper, which assumed that the combined rate on corporate income uh, would be the same, whether it was uh, in, a, in a prime bait on business income would be the same in a pass-through entity as it would be in a corporation, except in the corporation it would be achieved at two levels. And this assumed a corporate rate of 25%, which would leave $75 left out of 100, and then a uh, capital gain rate or a dividend rate of 20%, which would take away another 15 out of the 75, leaving 60, uh, which would be the same impact as a 40% rate on pass-through entities. And, and what was the difference? And, and that table uh, tries to compare um, the amount that would be accumulated uh, at the end, if, if assets were accumulated with inside the corporation for, the, for those particular periods of time, uh, and the rates of return were this, the rates of return set out. And you can see the numbers are over 100%, and that means that you would have more money if you use the corporate form as opposed to the pass-through form. And you can analyze that for reasons that I won't go into here by saying what you really are doing with the low corporate rate is you are able to reinvest earnings. If you have business earnings within the corporation and you reinvest them within the corporation, the tax on the, the, the return from reinvested earnings is basically at the low corporate rate rather than the 40% rate that would apply to pass-throughs. And since you are accumulating faster, uh, you get uh, more money at, at the end of certain periods. Now. Uh, one of the things that you see uh, in the interest charge proposals that Harry just described and in the mark market proposal in, in Allen and uh, Eric's paper is they want to get rid of that. They want to get rid of the benefit of the lower corporate rate in terms of the greater accumulation uh, at, at the end of these periods. So if that's your goal, then that as a reason to depart from integration uh, would presumably disappear. You wouldn't do it because you'd you're going through a lot of trouble with the interest charge on the market, the market in order to overcome it. Uh, the second difference is uh, the integration proposals assume that corporations would pay tax at 35%, uh, which could be considered a withholding tax, which would be uh, uh, credited against any shareholder tax on distributions, or could be reversed if you f f had a dividend deduction proposal. Uh, which way the corporation would get that money back if they paid out the dividends. Uh, that at least would be an initial tax of 35% at the corporate level, uh, which avoids the difficulty of making sure you collect 35%, because one of the things we're going to talk about, this assumes that you pay the second level tax on distributions, and that's hard to do in every single circumstance. Integration could easily avoid that, but we assume that that's a problem, that the a higher initial corporate rate uh, is a problem. Now, uh, what we've seen in these proposals, particularly Allen's proposal, where they're going to try to get the full tax rate in the first year by mark to market at the shareholder level, at least on some shareholders, uh, which does suggest that uh, at least in some ways it's possible to have the higher rate in the initial year without uh, violating why we want a low corporate rate. and uh, so, But it does seem to me that it's worth focusing on, on that aspect of it. If Chris thinks that Congress is prepared to go to integration, uh, that suggests that they're no longer talking about a low corporate rate and 
presumably because they think there are ways that it's uh, overcome. And those might be simpler uh, than what we're going to have to do in these proposals. Uh, so so what, to talk about the issues of trying to collect the second tax on distributions, which is what I want to focus on here, uh, if we uh, if we go to a system in which the uh, the, in, the corporate rate is 15 percent, and and the you're going to need a tax at the second level of at least 30, or actually 29 and a half to be more accurate. Uh, Harry and Roseanne, as we will see, propose that we have the full individual rates on distribution, uh, which leads you to different results. Uh, and that would get you a combined rate on corporate profits equal to the, to the rate on pass-through. But it's challenging to get the second rate of tax uh, because we know that U.S. shareholders, individual U.S. shareholders, uh, can avoid this burden uh, by charitable contributions of appreciated stock and by not selling anything until death and getting the step up in basis under 1014. Uh, now, we see in, uh, in, in Harry and Roseanne's proposal and also in Alan's proposal that they want to repeal Section 1014. Uh, and, you know, to my mind, getting rid of 1014 and limiting the basis, limiting the deduction for charitable contributions to basis are both very important and great reforms. I just don't think they're going to happen. And I think uh, to try to think they're going to happen as part of corporate tax reform, uh, it seems to me it's unrealistic. Now, maybe if we had corporate tax reform and individual tax reform at the same time, uh, one can see that as possibly happening, though, again, I would not count on it. But uh, it seems to me that that's a problem. I had proposed uh, a more modest approach, which would reduce the step up in basis by the decedent's share of undistributed corporate income at the time of death, so that the basis to the heirs would be fair market value less than the heir share of undistributed earnings. Now, that is actually the treatment you get under partnerships. That's what happens under partnerships. Uh, undistributed partnership income uh, doesn't uh, result in an increase in basis at the, uh, par at the partner level. Uh, it is the result under PFIC. Uh, it is the result under the ALI integration proposal, and it's certainly consistent with the way we treat other income. Salary earned before death is taxable when it's paid out to the heir. Uh, the heir doesn't get a basis equal to the value of the salary at the time of death. So this approach, which is obviously more complicated than repealing 1014, strikes me as more realistic and more likely to be enacted because if we're trying to duplicate the treatment of pass-throughs, this is exactly what you'd have to do in order to duplicate the, the treatment of pass-throughs. Uh, similarly, the charitable contribution, we, we don't have precedent for that, uh, but again, you, it would make sense to reduce the charitable contribution by the donor's share of undistributed income. Uh, since in some cases, like when there's a limit on the charitable deduction, there's actually no deduction for the charitable contribution, it actually would be better, and I guess if I... Where is that one? Oh, go forward, see what happens. Is, it, is there actually one there? No? Go, keep going, keep going, it's probably going to come down. Oh, no. No, all right. Well, on the bottom of that chart, you can see what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> uh, it, it would be better to uh, actually trigger a tax on undistributed earnings at the time of charitable contributions. But, of course, that, again, uh, would not be easy to do. Uh, now, the, the next question is the treatment of tax exempts and foreign shareholders. And those questions do come up under the integration proposals as well. The ALI integration proposal basically said uh, don't give a credit for the corporate tax to tax exempt institutions uh, and don't give it to uh, foreign investors unless there is a treaty in place. Uh, when we have to, when we're just getting a low corporate tax, it's a more difficult question, how do we get the tax? Uh, from tax exempt and foreigners. Now, it is absolutely clear, of course, that tax exempt shareholders, uh, assuming putting aside the incidence question, tax exempt shareholders indirectly bear the burden of the corporate tax 
which is the tr consistent with the treatment of such organizations uh, if they engage in business as a partner or as a sole proprietor where we have the tax and unrelated business income and ca collecting UBIT at the high individual rates uh, is often, I think, defended as a way of not encouraging corporations to, not encouraging charities, not encouraging Harvard to basically operate businesses on its own rather than buying shares of corporations uh, in order to avoid basically their share of the corporate tax. Uh, and it seems to me that revenue concerns at least suggest that tax exempt shareholders should not benefit from the corporate rate reduction and should pay tax on dividends and sale of shares so that the combined burden would not change from current law. Uh, that was essentially the goal of the ALI integration proposal, though they didn't specify the rate of tax to, to be applied to tax exempts. Uh, as Harry alluded to, uh, Allen's paper and the ALI paper both uh, propose equal treatment of debt and equity distributions uh, from corporations to tax exempts, and they think that has problems, and that's well beyond my expertise to, to get into that. But I think, uh, as they apparently would, as Harry and Roseanne would propose, would basically to let the low rate go down to 15% uh, and therefore reduce the burden on tax exempts, uh, to me is not, is a mistake. Uh, we, whether we can also uh, tax uh, foreign investors on distributions and sales is obviously a more difficult administrative problem, uh, and it's a more difficult problem in terms of its impact on investment in the United States. And, and I'll leave that to others uh, to decide. Uh, the next question that you get is uh, the treatment of, of pa <coughs> parity with uh, treatment of pastures. Uh, and as I said, uh, going back to that chart or to this one, uh, the corporate form would be uh, beneficial if we just had the two levels of tax. So this would lead uh, uh, to uh, incentives to retain earnings, as, as Harry said. It also would, uh, would lead to a um, attempt to expand the burden of corporations, uh, particularly closely held businesses would try to shift labor income into the corporate form to get the benefit of the lower tax and also trip, shift passive income uh, into the corporate form in order to get uh, the benefit of the lower tax. Uh, and the issue is, is if we're, how do we stop that from happening? And another reason to focus on is that the uh, The treatment of pass-through entities, uh, the second article up, up on that list uh, proposed, it's an article in tax notes that suggested that you could uh, extend the benefit of lower corporate rates to pass-through entities by giving them a lower rate on uh, the return on investment in the same way they have a lower rate on capital gain without a general reduction of individual rates. Uh, but that's obviously complicated and probably not very well understood. Uh, so. Uh, Unequal treatment of pass-throughs uh, has been a barrier to lower corporate rates. Uh, I think Chris mentioned that the pass-through community has opposed uh, the reduction of alternative rates. Uh, so basically, the, the idea, as I said earlier, in, uh, in both uh, Harry and Roseanne's paper and in uh, Alan and uh, Eric's paper, is to attempt to eliminate the advantage of deferral, either by mark-to-market -market or an interest charge. Uh, but the challenge is to do that without creating a disadvantage for the corporate form. And both mark-to-market -market and the interest charge, as suggested, would do more than level the playing field with pass-throughs. They would actually create a bias in favor of uh, the pass-through entities. Uh, and they would do that because they would eliminate deferred taxation of unrealized gains. Mark the market would subject unrealized gains to current tax, not just the taxable income earned at the corporate level. And an interest charge, if it applied to the entire gain on sales, without regard to when realized at the corporate level, 
would again seek to effectively tax unrealized gains as they occur. This would create a potential advantage for pass-throughs, which would continue to defer uh, tax on unrealized gains. Now, ha Harry and Roseanne's proposal attempt to solve this problem, as he said, by subjecting all sales to the interest charge regime, not just the sale of corporate stock, and eliminating capital gain treatment on all assets. Uh, Alan and Eric don't go quite that far, but they would extend their market market uh, beyond corporate stock, and they would also, both of them would eliminate uh, the step up in basis under 1014. Um, it just seems to me that both proposals are not only complex, but not likely to be feasible. I think elimination of 1014 and elimination of so narrowing treatment or eliminating treatment of capital gains in the context of corporate tax reform uh, is not going to happen. Uh, so one other possibility, which may not be any more realistic, is to consider whether we could allocate earnings to shareholders uh, currently. We can achieve quality, e equality with pass-throughs, if we can allocate corporate income not unrealized gains, but corporate income directly to the shareholders uh, each year, at least with respect to U.S. shareholders, uh, and impose tax annually at individual rates. That would get the full rate of tax at the corporate level right away. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry about mark to market, and we wouldn't have to worry about an interest charge. Now, that has been considered uh, in the past with respect to all these integration proposals, which, for which the, somebody referred to the graveyard for them. It was all, it was rejected every time as just not administratively feasible. We could not have pass-through treatment for corporations in the same way we have for partnerships. Now, given how complicated partnerships have become in the interim and how much we've improved in computer power, I, I wonder if that's still true. Uh, the Treasury, uh, uh, proposed originally uh, in, I mean, the ALI proposal suggested that we would have allow constructive dividends. Uh, the, currently, under the proposal of 35 percent corporate tax, if an individual was at a lower rate, uh, they would pay the 35 percent until the dividend uh, occurred. And also, they would have no basis step up from, from receipt of the dividend, so they would have a capital gain again if they sold the stock. So it allowed corporations to have constructive dividends, which would say we treat a dividend as if being paid out and paid back to the corporation. That would give the shareholder a uh, refund if their rate was uh, lower than 35 percent. It would also give them a basis step up in the case of future sales. So that, uh, that proposal assumed everybody would do that because it was obviously an advantage to do that, and that it was going to be feasible. So the question to me that I would think of, well, if it's feasible, if it's elective, uh, would it be feasible if it's mandatory? Now, obviously, of course, anything you make mandatory is impossible, and anything is elective is fine. But uh, in, in the real world, I think there shouldn't be a great deal of difference. If, if, he, if we are going to live with an elective proposal, which has all the abuse potential that we would worry about from people allocating income to places that it didn't really belong, uh, presumably we could live with a mandatory proposal as well. Uh, and it seems to me that that is at least initially not necessarily more complicated than trying to go to an interest charge proposal with all the difficulty it has. And it also would not require uh, that we eliminate special capital gain treatment uh, for uh, assets other than uh, for other assets outside the corporation. And we don't have to fully repeal 1014. We could limit the basis step up, uh, as I have suggested in the past. So I think there's, there's at least that other way to think about it. So I think that's my time. Right? Thanks, Dan. So I think what should be clear, if nothing else is, is just the following simple proposition. This is incredibly difficult, right? <laughs> Taxing corporate profits turns out to be really, really hard. And in the first panel, we gave you a sense about some of the key challenges in collecting this tax at the entity level. And they're hard. They're not easy to fix. In this panel, we've talked about some of the key challenges in collecting tax at the investor level. They're also really difficult. So um, I want to 
offer a couple of other takeaways that are going to be the basis for what I want to say in the next few minutes. You already know, very difficult. The second takeaway is, therefore, I think we actually need both of these taxes. I think we really should have both a corporate tax and an investor level tax. Um, and so uh, you could maybe think of what I'm about to say as how I learned to love the double tax. Because obviously a lot of us sort of thought for a long time that it would be better maybe to have one tax and not the other. And there have been a number of proposals along those lines. The more I think about it, the more I think that's a mistake. Having said it, my next point after that, you've already kind of heard from me, Carthage must be destroyed. Uh, I think we do need to cut the corporate tax, and I would be in favor of raising the shareholder tax in order to fund it, and I'll talk a bit about why. And then the third thing I'll do, time permitting, is to mention a couple of other reform proposals, just to ask the question, do they involve using both taxes or just one? And if I've persuaded you by that point that actually we need both, that would be something to notice about a reform. If it doesn't use both, maybe that's a problem. But let me start with the idea that um, it's really important actually to have both of these taxes. And um, at some level, that should be surprising because after all, a corporation's earning some money, the owners of the business own it. Does it really matter whether we're taking money from one pocket or the other, taking it from the corporation or from the owner? At first blush, it really shouldn't matter. But the reason it matters, and it matters quite a lot, is that the tax planning at each level is very different. And so we kind of have to keep in mind that uh, what we do one way will affect the other way. If you repeal one, you're solving a bunch of problems, but you're creating uh, a bunch of other problems at the other level. Um, since I've been using classics references today, I will add another, which is Scylla and Charybdis. For those of you who liked the Odyssey, as I do, you will remember there was a point where poor Odysseus had to get through this area, and on one side there was this man-eating monster, Scylla. On the other side, there was a ship-destroying whirlpool, Charybdis, and he kind of had to figure out which of those which of those bad things he wanted to deal with. And I think in a way, this is where we are with corporate tax reform. We've got, you know, Scylla, S, shareholders. We've got Charybdis, C, the corporate tax, and there are problems with each. So let me start with Charybdis, just to remind you of what we said in the last panel. If you have a high corporate rate and you're trying to collect tax at the corporate level, the way corporations will respond, among other things, is to shift their income to another jurisdiction. And um, it is not obvious how you can stop them from doing it as long as your rate is a lot higher than the rate they would find in another jurisdiction. Therefore, a lower rate is going to be better on that dimension. That's one. A second, which we also talked about, is the residence of the corporation. Inversions. They're going to have an incentive to change their residence so that their foreign earnings are no longer subject uh, to this high corporate rate. So either way, um, these are big problems with taxing at the corporate level. Therefore, it is very tempting to cut the corporate rate or even maybe to eliminate the corporate tax entirely and to collect tax at the shareholder level only, let's say. And what you should notice is that the two issues that I just described, they do go away. So why is that? Let's go back to income shifting. Let's say we wanted to have a combined corporate and shareholder tax of 40%. One option is you've got um, a zero corporate rate, 0% 0 corporate rate, and a 40% shareholder rate. So if you're in that world where you're ta t collecting this tax only from shareholders, is there still an incentive for the corporation to shift income? The answer is no. Because when you're a shareholder and you receive a dividend, um, it doesn't affect your tax liability, whether the underlying profits were earned in the United States or Ireland. Either way, uh, the tax rate and the fact that the taxes do, it's based on the, your personal residence. It has nothing to do with where the income was earned at the corporate level. So by collecting tax at the shareholder level, you eliminate this issue of uh, incentivizing firms to move their profits overseas. It's gone. Second point, um, inversions. Uh, is there a benefit to you as a shareholder if the corporate rate is zero and the shareholder rate is 40%? Again, no. It doesn't matter what the residence of the corporation is. If you've got a dividend or you've got a capital gain, um, it, it no longer, uh, it, your tax is going to be the same, whether um, it's a U.S. firm or a foreign firm that you've invested in. So the point is, by reducing the corporate rate, say, to 15%, you can really uh, deal with those issues. An offsetting increase in the shareholder tax does not bring those issues back. Uh, so again, 
Um, one way to deal with inversions and uh, income shifting is a low or even zero corporate tax and a higher shareholder tax. But although we've done that, so we've avoided these problems, we then have the other problems that the panel has been talking about, and they're also pretty hard to deal with. So, um, okay, so we want to collect the capital gains tax under current law. You can do that only when the shareholder sells. So they won't sell, right? We've got lock-in. They're going to wait. Um, Harry and Roseanne have the interesting idea of trying to eliminate the benefit of lock-in with an interest charge. It's a good idea. Uh, Alan and Eric have talked about using mark-to-market accounting. It's also a good idea. But the point is, if you don't do anything, and all you do is you increase the rate, you're going to have that issue. So you solved the income shifting, and you solved uh, inversions, but at the cost of making this shareholder lock-in point harder. Uh, people are going to be slower to sell their stock. They're going to hold on to the stock to avoid the realization. They will ideally, from their perspective, die with this stock. Um, the basis steps up. Uh, no tax is ever collected, or maybe they contribute it to charity. The appreciation is never subject to tax. These are points Dan was just emphasizing. So you have those issues. Another issue, which Dan has emphasized, is that, um, well, a tax is triggered when the uh, you know, money comes out as a dividend, but the firm is, is going to be less likely to do that because if you've got a low corporate rate, or my original assumption was a zero corporate rate, well, all of a sudden, keeping the money inside the corporation is just like an IRA. It's just going to grow tax-free, as Dan was emphasizing. The pace of that growth is faster than if the money is dividended out and shareholders are investing it. So what you've done is you have that issue, too. You've trapped earnings because you've shifted the burden from corporations to shareholders. Um, and then, of course, the other point, which we've already discussed, is so it's fine to say that you want to collect this tax from shareholders. But as of now, it seems like about one third of US equities are held in taxable accounts. And the rest of it, and again, these are estimates, but the rest of it is held by um, tax exempts who pay no dividend and no capital gains tax, and by foreigners who pay no capital gains tax and potentially um, a reduced dividend tax because of treaties. So um, again, Scylla and Charybdis, you can try to solve the problems of inversions and um, income shifting by eliminating the corporate tax and relying only on the shareholder tax. You do solve those problems, but at the cost of exacerbating these problems, we also have uh, shareholders hold on to stock, earnings gets trapped inside the corporation, and uh, clientele effects because foreigners and tax exempts don't pay the full tax at the shareholder level. Um, you're not going to necessarily collect the revenue that you want. So I think I've, I'm really just recapping what we've said already along the lines of this is really difficult. Um, but what I uh, take away from that, which maybe isn't obvious, is therefore we need both taxes. And so just to sum it up, because they're both such bad taxes and so ineffective, we need both of them, <laughs> doesn't necessarily follow. So let me explain why I think that. I think there are really three reasons. One uh, is built-in redundancy. Uh, engineers will tell you that if you've got the possibility of failure in one system, you want another system to back it up. And I think in some sense that's what we have when we try to collect tax both at the corporate level and at the shareholder level. There will be some avoidance at the corporate level, but some of that will be soaked up at the shareholder level. Um, yes, you can shift earnings, but when you pay that dividend to a US uh, shareholder, you're going to collect some capital gains tax or you're going to collect some, some dividends tax. So the built-in redundancy, I think, is important. Uh, it's a safer strategy from the FISC's perspective than relying only on one tax because we know that each of these taxes can be avoided one way or the other. So that's point number one. The second point is, um, as we think about each of these distortions, they're ugly, and it is true that you can make them better by repealing the tax, but I actually think you don't even have to go quite that far. Repeal is sort of an overkill type response if what you're trying to do is deal with these distortions because instead a, a really significant rate cut would accomplish maybe all of what you needed to do uh, while at the same time still leaving you with some revenue. So just to be specific about it, when the US corporate rate is 35%, um, Corporations do have a significant incentive either to move real activity or instead to keep the real activity as it is, but to repackage it so that it's booked as being earned offshore. They absolutely have that incentive. How do you eliminate that incentive? 
You could certainly eliminate that incentive by cutting the corporate rate from 35 to zero. But I submit to you that you could also eliminate that incentive by cutting the rate from 35% to 15%. I think you would accomplish the goal, but you don't have to go as far as zero. You don't have to zero the tax out in order to deal with it. And I would say the same thing about the shareholder tax. It is true that the higher that rate goes, the more incentive shareholders have not to sell. If you bring the tax rate to zero, people will no longer worry about selling their stock. But I think if the rate is low enough, they're going to think it's better to sell and pay the tax than to hold on to something that they don't want. So uh, my first reason is built-in redundancy. My second reason to have both of these taxes is that repeal is farther than we have to go. Tax planning is not free. It's expensive. If the gains from tax planning, if the tax you're avoiding is low enough, people will just pay the tax. Uh, the third point is, of course, um, if you repeal one, the other has to be higher. If you're trying to collect the same amount of revenue, if you repeal one instead of bringing it to 15%, then the other rate has to be correspondingly higher. And the higher that rate is, the more serious these distortions will be. So my point is, let's say you wanted a 15% corporate rate. And let's say we want to collect a total of 40% from both. It means you're going to need about a 30% shareholder tax. That's high. Uh, but a 40% tax would be even higher, which is what we would do if we zeroed out the corporate rate entirely. So for these reasons, I actually think that what we should want is both of these taxes. We shouldn't eliminate one and rely only on the other. What we should do is think carefully about what the combined burden is that we want. My vote would be for it to match, at least uh, on paper, to match the rate that we're collecting from pass-throughs. So I view this as a form of integration, really. Uh, but they need to be thought about together. And then you have to try to coordinate them. And of course, you have to try to um, plug the holes in both, which is, needless to say, uh, not very easy. Now, um, what follows from that? So I'm saying we should have both taxes. It doesn't mean they should be the same. You should have a lower rate for the one that you think is more distortive. My vote is that the corporate rate is more distortive, and so we ought to lean in the direction of a lower corporate rate and uh, a higher shareholder rate. Um, and we ought to try to plug these various holes. We ought to try to fix these distortions, do as much of that as we can. Um, in principle, I think we know what we would do in a lot of these circumstances. We also know that it's administratively challenging and also politically difficult, a point that Danny has made uh, a couple of times. So I'm not saying that I'm convinced that we will fix all of these issues, but I think with any of them, rebalancing the rates so that the corporate rate is lower and the shareholder rate is higher, I think is going to be better. So um, I'll just spend a couple more minutes making observations about first something that exists under current law and then a couple of other proposals that have been offered just to show that if you believe, as I've urged you to believe, that we actually need both taxes, then there are some things that we do that don't necessarily make sense. So let me start with the interest deduction, which is something that came up before. So um, how many taxes do we use, really, to collect um, revenue from debt-financed income? And the answer under current law is one. It's only at the investor level. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you've got a business and it's generating revenue and it's using that revenue to service its debt, it gets to deduct uh, that cost, which means that there is no tax collected at the entity level. Instead, the full tax is collected from the investor. The investor earns interest. The investor is supposed to pay tax on interest. Now, if the timing of all this is the same, the rate is the same, and we actually collect it, it doesn't matter. You're collecting your 40% tax, let's say, and the fact that you collect it from the investor alone with none from the corporation doesn't matter. But where it starts to matter, for example, is when we have investors, and of course we do, who pay no tax on interest, tax exempts foreigners. And so what that means is that actually no tax under current law is collected from a public company that borrows money and deducts interest. So that's inconsistent with what I'm describing. What would be more consistent would be to say, you know what, we're not going to have an interest deduction, but instead of a 35% rate, we're going to have a 15% rate. And then for both debt and equity, we're going to collect 15% tax at uh, the corporate level. And then an investor level tax, which is not the full tax, say it's 28 or so, so the two aggregate. But the point is you would divide the collection between the corporation 
and the shareholder. That would be uh, between the corporation and the investor. And you would do the same thing. This is the point. You would do the same thing for um, both the um, debt and equity. You would conform them, but you can conform them in different ways. Now, I will contrast this with the suggestion that Edward has made, which I think is a really interesting suggestion. Both of us have just described a way to treat debt and equity the same, but Edward is doing it differently. My point was really to extend the treatment of equity to debt. Edward is going in the other direction, extending the treatment of debt to equity. You get a deduction for each one. And in principle, they're the same, but in practice, once you have uh, tax-exempt investors, they're not the same. And so if I've persuaded you that it's a problem to rely on only one tax, particularly because at the investor level you may not collect it, you might actually prefer something else. Um, but again, uh, there are a lot of things that I really appreciate about Edward's proposal, including how creative he is in plugging some of these holes. So it's a really interesting idea. But just keep in mind, if you think we need two taxes, that wouldn't necessarily be the way to do it. Um, meanwhile, um, Harry and Roseanne's proposal is very much in the spirit that I'm describing. They're keeping a 15% tax. They're also trying to collect tax at the shareholder level, a higher rate than we have now, and they're trying to plug these holes. So that's very much in the spirit of what I'm describing. Um, as a preview, and I would encourage you guys to come to the conference about Alan and Eric's idea because it's really interesting. Uh, what I would say about that is that there are two versions of their proposal. There's one they made in 2014. There's one they made more recently in 2016. And if I've persuaded you that two taxes are better than one, you're going to like the 26 pro 2016 proposal better than the one two years ago. And the reason is that two years ago, what they suggested was to eliminate the corporate tax and to collect tax from shareholders on a mark-to-market -market basis, relying only on shareholders, but the latest version doesn't do that. Instead, it keeps a 15% rate at the corporate level and then still uses mark to market at the shareholder level, but with a lower rate. And to my mind, that's, you know, that's better, more, more consistent with um, the ideas that I'm describing. Uh, and last, last quick thought is about imputation systems, because we've referred to them, but just to be sure you know what, what they are, so this is uh, this is a kind of approach where the corporation pays a tax and then the shareholder can claim a credit for the tax that the corporation has already paid. So let's say the corporation earns $100, let's say the corporate tax is 35% and a shareholder is in the 40% bracket. The way it works under an imputation system is the corporation is paid 35%, maybe it's distributing $65 out to the shareholder. What the shareholder does is include not only the 65, but the 35 also, the full 100, and then they claim a tax credit based on the 35, and they're just gonna pay an additional 5% tax. Um, what I like about this is you really are collecting tax at both levels, so if you worry about leaks and distortions in one, the other is um, working to offset it. Uh, so I think integration in that way, the imputation system, actually has the features of using two taxes that I appreciate, uh, and so that is an advantage. And with that, I thank you and turn it back to you, Alan. Do any of the panelists want to respond to any of the points that were made by any of the other panelists? Well, I did, I did leave one thing out. If we could go to the last slide there. Uh, that one or? Is that? Pre-tax pre rate of return. Is that this one? That's it. Yeah. Is this the one? Is there one after them? Table five. No, there should be one after that. Is there one after that? That's before it. Okay, but I think there's no. two. That's all you got? No, that, that way. Yeah. Uh, that table uh, does deal with the question of would you want a combined rate higher than the uh, pass-through rate, which uh, Harry and Roseanne suggested. And uh, one of the things that does is, is that it tells you that the accumulation is not long enough, you're much better off with a pass-through, uh, which would create less incentive to, to shift income into the corporate form. 
Uh, it would also compensate to some extent for not getting the second level tax at all, though uh, at least because, or at least some people would be paying too much. So one question is, you know, they propose that. Uh, uh, what are they thinking about in, in, in doing that? I mean, what, what's, what's the goal? <laughs> is, it, is it to reduce the, the likelihood that people will shift into the corporate form? Yes, yeah, that's one, of the, that's one of the behavioral responses which you um, right. alluded to. So if, you know, the question I would have raised, if you can live with that, then you might not want to worry about the interest charge and, and the uh, and the mark to market. Uh, at least it, it, it suggests that it's less important because the advantage is less important. But how about realization behavior, uh, dividend uh, right. behavior? Uh, that's still, probably the main that's thing. still there. And, that's uh, still there. And, that, yeah. and in fact, it's worse. That, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Well, just in, in response to, to Dan's thoughtful comments, and he, he talked, and this is in response to the idea of something being realistic or unrealistic. I mean, honestly, any reform that would accomplish anything seems unrealistic in today's environment. So, I mean, what, at a certain point, we need some leadership, and I think it's important for us to be thinking about reforms that, I mean, PFIC exists. There are interest charges out there. Um, and we should be thinking about, in terms of realistic or unrealistic, what are the benefits of the reform? What are the costs? Is it administrable? How does it compare to other type reforms? Um, and just keying off of that, going to David, who likes to keep both types of taxes, which we've also been arguing for, um, how do you feel about adding a third tax that would help you with your, your, your revenue problems that you, you may be creating for yourself? Because you want to keep both taxes, but you want to them to be at lower rates, the corporate one particularly so. How do you feel about adding another tax that, that does have problems but is, is the VAT that may, may, and the whole thing that you're talking about is just lowering the rates. We, we know that raising the rates leads to distortions exponentially. Lowering the rates is, 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 it, it reduces them the same way. And you could make that up with a, with a VAT, which of course has an enforcement problems. So I guess I would throw back to you, how about a third tax? <laughs> so um, I am for cutting the corporate tax. I'm actually for increasing the shareholder tax. Uh, but for doing that in combination with something that would reach tax exempts and foreigners mm -hmm. too. And then if in addition to that, we can do um, incremental steps to deal with deferral and, and other things, I would, you know, I would be for that as well. And exactly how low the rates go is going to depend upon the other things that we would do. Uh, but you ask a very important question, which is, um, what about a third tax? Or maybe a different way to say it is, maybe corporate profits aren't the best thing to tax. Maybe there's a more efficient way to raise this revenue. And I tend to be sympathetic with that. It does seem to me that taxing multinationals is one of the hardest things that our system has to do. Uh, whether the answer is to have um, a VAT or to have oh. a higher personal income tax, or I mean, there, there are various things that one can do. But um, the premise that I've been taking to this analysis is that we're going to try to collect roughly the same amount of revenue, but reconfigure how we do it within the corporate sector. But there is certainly an argument that it's so hard here, we should try for a little less and make it up elsewhere. How do you tax foreigners, either in dividends or capital gains? Yeah, so I think with tax exempts it's easier. Um, and I don't know that it's easy politically, it certainly isn't. But I think technically um, we know that they're earning dividends, they're selling, you could have a low tax on them to make up for the change in the corporate tax. Because remember, they're paying the corporate tax indirectly through the corporation. If you go from 35 to 15, there's a fair amount of tax that indirectly uh, they're no longer paying. You can impose it on them directly. Uh, with foreigners, it's harder for because of treaties. And I think with the treaties, you're going to have to renegotiate them if but you want to do something. Uh, that's diffidence. What about capital gains? Yeah, so um, that's the hard part. I don't know that it's hard. I mean, they're, they're just as a technical matter, um, I've heard very different things about this. One point that people make is, gee, but we're not tracking that, and can we rely on them to report it? On the other hand, with dividends, we are tracking whether the owner is foreign. So there is some infrastructure in place to try to um, get information for the government about these capital gains. I, I do think you know, it's a well-established principle that we don't tax them. This would be a change. It would have to be negotiated. Um, we might 
worry about losing access to foreign capital, which is really important to have. I tend to think that that's not an issue if the tax is low. I'm not sure that zero is the number that has to be in order to attract that capital, given the special advantages of the US market. But the other thing to think about is if uh, other countries respond by increasing the tax burden they impose on US investors, and those US investors then claim foreign tax credits, we may not even come out ahead. So I think with foreigners, you have to think carefully. For me, with tax exempts, it seems a bit simpler. Yeah. Well, David, you alluded to this, but I mean, actually, I think that's there's a broader question here. I mean, do we want to tax the foreigners? I mean, one of the major I mean, flaws right. of having a high corporate income tax rate is that there is too severe of a disincentive for foreigners to invest in the United States. We, of course, only tax the foreigners if they invest here. If we lower the corporate tax rate, but then try to make up the revenue loss, uh, you know, make up the tax cut that we're giving to foreigners, are we really undermining one of the gains uh, from the reform? I mean, isn't part of the purpose of lowering the corporate tax rate to provide tax savings to foreigners who invest here so that the severe disincentives to investing here would be ameliorated? I mean, so I say no. Uh, I say yes to a point is really my answer. I think. Um, the problem with the 35% rate is in part, as you say, that it's a high burden which applies to every investor, including foreigners. Maybe we're not getting the capital we want. But I actually think the bigger problem with it is the behavioral responses that it induces at the corporate level. And it seems to me that, so I'm talking about income shifting, residence shifting. And for those, trying to tax the shareholder doesn't matter. So then the question becomes, how motivated would foreign investors be uh, to invest in the United States if what it means is a tax on them directly as opposed to a tax on the corporation getting at them indirectly. Uh, and I think it's got to be right, as you're suggesting, that there's a number that's too high. Um, on the other hand, my guess is that there's a lower number which isn't zero, which is going to work, and in exactly what that number is is probably above my pay grade to figure out. But it might not be above the corporate tax rate that you're keeping in place, in which case there's no need to have any additional taxes on. Yeah, on I mean, if, if we think 15% is enough, and if we were able to get there, it, it might be the right number, or it might be that it'd be 15 and 5 or 15 and 7. Um, and that's where the rubber hits the road for me, and I don't know the answer. I mean, I think that it's important to realize that the tax on the foreign investor, and it, I think it is very difficult to decide how to administer it, but presumably the tax, however you do it, is going to be based on whether the income is deemed to have been earned in the United States or not, and or whether it was earned through a U.S. resident corporation. And so these disincentives for corporate residents and for investment in the United States and for booking profits in the United States you know, would all still, uh, still persist, maybe along with a lot of administrative complications. We well, do, uh, Alan, just one more point is we do seem to be okay with taxing foreigners on real estate investments. And as a resident of Manhattan, I can tell you that um, it hasn't been a problem attracting the capital that way. Yeah, but they ex you, exempt f you exempt portfolio holdings. 5% holdings of 5% stock or less are exempt just because they administer problems. So you'd have, you just inherit those problems. Right. Okay, let's uh, open this up uh, for audience uh, questions. Uh, please um, wait for the microphone to come to you. Sorry, and under your 15% proposal, um, the, uh, uh, what happens to the foreign tax credit? It, well, it, it, we do, we refer to the treatment of foreign income, uh, either under the overall or the per country t t <coughs> um, um, minimum tax. You would, you would, uh, for example, we have a per country uh, minimum, minimum tax um, in Ireland. If the ten, uh, the effective tax rate was ten percent, then you had to pay the extra five. Well, well, yes. You really so. end up getting the revenue that you're talking about. No, okay. It's hard to predict the effect of uh, the effect of BEPS, whether whether the, whether the French or the UK, UK unders diverted profits tax, if they will sort of cap, they will sort of uh, basically tax Google and Apple, uh, and there, you're saying there won't be much income to to yeah. subject to the minimum tax. Well, that's an that's an empirical question. I'm not sure it's going to be a huge effect. But there still will be a foreign foreign tax credit. Yeah. Absolutely. No question. And, and, and the rent tax is really mainly directed against, certainly a per country minimum tax, is mainly directed against the tax havens. 
it's the it's the income in Bermuda and places like that that you would, would where the revenue comes from. Okay, uh, Eric Toder, I had three uh, tax policies. I had three quick questions, one for each speaker. For, for Danny, I was wondering in your full integration proposal how you would deal with uh, U.S. shareholders in foreign corporations who are not uh, compelled to report profits to the U.S. For Harry, um, I, it seems that you're retaining the double taxation on corporate income, taxing co corporate income at a higher rate than partnership income, and, and is that a concern, and what would you do about it? And for um, David, I was just going to ask you, since if, if you don't go to accrual versions of taxation, would you think about um, restoring the differential between dividends and capital gains on the grounds that capital gains are more elastic than dividends? Can, can you repeat it again, Eric? I'm not sure I got it. Um, so it's okay. So, so, so my concern was if you have a full integration proposal, U.S. corporations would require to report income to shareholders, and presumably with the technology, we could figure out who the shareholders are today. But what about foreign corporations who are not required to report their worldwide profits to the U.S. government. How would you deal with U.S. shareholders in those Well, why would, why would it change from where we are today? <laughs> well, because you've basically eliminated the corporate tax. You've, you've, you've moved to a, 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 an integration system. But with the foreign corporate corporations, they're, they're basically is, you're, you're not well, if you're not taxing the You're shareholder. assuming the foreign corporation has uh, U.S. source income? Yeah, uh, well, I have U.S. shareholders. But it could be a portfolio holder. U.S. shareholders, holder. I don't it care. Could be a yeah. Portfolio, yeah. Pure portfolio, portfolio holder. Yeah, well, but uh, there is no, I don't see what's happening. I mean, it, uh, U.S. today, uh, foreign corporations with U.S. shareholders, let's assume all their income is foreign income. They don't, they're not subject to the U.S. jurisdiction. We have to somehow tax the U.S. shareholders. I don't think shifting to an integration system in the U.S. makes that any harder than it was before or any different than it was before. But you can get a deferral by switching to a foreign stock rather than a domestic stock. Yeah, it, which, which you... As a portfolio holder. Yes, and you couldn't get it today, you mean, because... No, because you still get deferral in a, in a domestic corporation. Yeah. Changes the relative treatment. Right. Yeah. Now, in terms of it's true, we admit we there's still a, uh, we still uh, can see, we can see that, that we still have a double tax. Uh, now, uh, just because we don't want the complications of uh, integration, and, but if you're really worried about it, you could or instead of taxing dividends and capital gains at the at the full 39 points or whatever it is, the full. Uh, tax on ordinary income, you could lower it a little for dividends and capital gains. There would be a, it wouldn't be the, con the concessionary rate you have now, but it would be slight, a slight reduction just to, to offset what you say is a double tax. But presumably we still have the revenue constraint. Right. One quick point on the conversation you're having with Danny and then an answer to your question. So Danny, if the foreign firm has U.S. source income, and it's got a U.S. shareholder. Shouldn't the U.S. shareholder have to pay tax on it? I mean, that's what would happen with a pass-through. In the foreign corporation, which has U.S. source income, is presumably going to be paying tax, it's, it, 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 at least under an integration proposal. Now, if but, we uh, lower, if we was, lower was the your, rates to Was your question about your pass-through idea, though? That's what I thought you were asking about, Eric. Yeah, remember when you were talking about treating public corporations more like partnerships. Okay. Then I think in that spirit, in that you spirit, would tax that. And, and how would you then tax the foreign corporation? Uh, your idea, shareholders not and my... shareholders and far How you would yeah. tax the shareholders and foreign corporations? A U.S. shareholder of a foreign corporation with U.S. source income on a pass-through basis. And, well, I, I would say, I guess, that uh, if you could go to a pass-through basis as a way of limiting the situations in which you would uh, be trying to impose an interest charge or trying to impose mark-to-market, uh, and you, you might want to have to continue to do that with, with, with foreign investments, I, th I think. I, I, I think I did say in my, in my notes, though I, didn't, I don't think I said it here, that I see the pass-through as being applicable to U.S. shareholders of U.S. corporations. And not further than that. 
Okay, okay I get it. <laughs> So, uh, and Eric, you make a, a good point. More generally, the issue is, mm -hmm. so let's say you want to cut corporate tax for all the reasons that I've said. You want to hire uh, shareholder tax, but you still have these problems with actually collecting it. Realizations get deferred. Um, the dividends uh, don't get paid very often mm -hmm. and all the rest. So what do you do? Um, in principle, what I would really like is to have these rates coordinated so that the statutory rates are the same uh, as the statutory rate on pass through businesses so there's conformity, uh, as everyone has pointed out, though um, the effective rate may well be much lower in the corporate sector, which is why you might want to have an adjustment, something Danny has said, to have it be higher. And then your question is, in addition to that, when you think about what rate you want to collect from shareholders, do you want to have the same rate for dividends and capital gains, or would you like to have a higher rate for dividends and a lower rate for capital gains? Uh, and the reason you're raising it, and it's a perfectly valid point to make is that it does seem as if um, realizations, whether you sell, is more discretionary, it's elastic, therefore you might think you wanted a lower rate for that, but for dividends you could take a little more, maybe. I think, you know, I think there are real benefits to having those rates be the same, um, including you avoid at least some of the craziness that has to do with whether you want to have share buybacks or dividends as a way to get cash out to shareholders. So I do like trying to keep those rates the same. But uh, on the other hand, if there's compelling evidence that uh, the corporate, that the capital gains tax is going to be harder to collect, and we had to make it lower, I, I take the point. So David, are you assuming that the rate would be higher than the rate we have now? Because when we lowered the, the dividend rate to the capital gain rate, we presumably had a capital gain rate we could live with. But if you're now saying, yeah. well, what I'd like it, the shareholder higher. tax to be higher, yes. then the question is, can you apply that to capital gain? Um, and I think uh, I, th I would try. I would try. But I, I certainly recognize the challenges there. Hi, Harvey Galper from the Urban Institute. Uh, one thing that becomes very clear from the discussion earlier as well as now is that you just can't separate business taxation from personal income taxation. And yet the whole thrust of what seems to be on the table right now is just dealing with business taxation, or perhaps even more narrowly, corporate taxation. So how do you change the focus of the current debate so that you don't preclude what should be done in an integrated fashion by any changes that might be made uh, just on the business tax side? So, well, Roseanne, go ahead. I, mean, I, I think our, I mean, what we're, what we're putting forward clearly puts the individual and the, the corporate together, and there seems to be a lot of steam building up for integration. So I think there's starting to be that realization that corporate and individual or business and individual has to go together. I, I, I think you kind of immediately find yourself into a, in, a, in a very small box. Like it's hard to get out of when you just focus in on, on business. I, I, think, I think that realization has has occurred, but I, I could be wrong. So I'm going to take a more benighted view, uh, which is that although I'm, I think it's really important when you tax corporate profits to think about the corporation and the shareholder. And in addition, when you do that, it's very important to think about how pass-through businesses are taxed. I would say, nevertheless, that the problems are somewhat different because the markets are different. And in particular, uh, two things that particularly worry me uh, about the taxation of public companies are the shifting of income overseas and the incentives to change the residence of the corporation. And those are just different issues than what are faced uh, in smaller businesses, sort of your standard uh, pass-through family business. They're, they're not thinking about how to book their income in Ireland as opposed to the US. It's just a different setting. And they do, by the way, have other types of tax planning which are uh, effective and they're familiar. I mean, if you're dealing with a cash business, kind of hard for the government to know exactly what you're earning. Um, there's also the point about um, converting salary to um, business profits by paying yourself a below market salary. If, for example, a C corporation with a low rate was available for that kind of business. So you do have to worry about this stuff. You have to think about it all together. But I do think these are distinct issues, and it's appropriate to think about what to do with multinationals separately. 
you know, uh, I've decided to no longer to pay any attention to what's happening in this town, so that uh, gives uh. me a disadvantage or an advantage. But if if we really uh, believe that it's really important to do something about the taxation of multinational corporations, and also believe that individual tax reform is something that's not likely to happen in the foreseeable future, you end up in an imperfect world. Obviously, it's better to do them together, but if, if it's that's not going to happen, I think you just have to focus on whether the first issue is important enough to solve that we should do it imperfectly. Now, you know, I can't answer that, and I, I'm sure Congress is not thinking that way, but it, that, that would be a reason to separate them. And there probably is some limited scope of business taxation reform that could be done without touching the individual side, such as simply changing some of the rules affecting multinationals. But clearly, once you get beyond that, I think you it's hard to escape the fact that these are intertwined. Well, uh, I don't think that we have resolved all of these issues, uh, despite our hopes that we would. Uh, we have come to the end of our time for today. But again, if you are interested in learning more about these issues, do go to the AI website and sign up for the June 17th conference, uh, uh, co-sponsored with the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, where Eric Toder and I will be uh, presenting uh, the revised version of our plan. Uh, lunch is available outside for those who are able to stay for that. Uh, please join me now in thanking our panel. Well, I hope I wasn't.